Welcome to this week's Who the Folk podcast. I'm Lonnie Goldsmith, the editor of TCG Folk. This week I'm thrilled to be joined by Miriam Graham, the new J-Pride coordinator at Jewish Family and Children's Services of Minneapolis. We talk about what she's looking forward to programming, embracing Judaism as a convert, and if she's planning on following her predecessors to become a rabbi on this week's Who the Folk podcast. Miriam Graham, welcome to this week's Who the Folk podcast. Hi, how's it going? It's going great. Thanks for joining us. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. It's sunny. Um, Have a nice day. Well, excellent. Well, uh, you are the new J Pride coordinator at uh, Jewish Family Children's Service of Minneapolis. Uh, first of all, Mazel Tov on for starters. Uh, and <laughs> second of all, how I guess how did you come to the job? What was it about the job that was so appealing? Uh, thank you. And I uh, was pretty good friends with Jace Kester, who was the previous J Pride coordinator, and I've been volunteering for various J Pride events for a really long time. Um, I moved to the Twin Cities almost five years ago, and since then have been a participant in J Pride programs. So when Jace approached me and said, "Hey, this position is going to be open. You should really think about applying," I just jumped at it. It, you know, it was all stuff I'd already been doing before, stuff I was really passionate about, um, you know, making queer Jewish stuff happen is my jam. <laughs> well, that's awesome. So it's the right job for you then? Yeah, it's, it's, I'm really, really enjoying it. It's right up my alley. That's, that's excellent. So what type, I mean, I, I know for a, for a lot of people, they know J Pride just as you know the people that have the table out at Loring Park <laughs> right. during Pride. How how do you sort of take the energy that so many people put into Pride and sort of carry that throughout programming year round? I think it's Pride has got this really big energy, like you're saying. It's a it's the middle of the summer. It's this big, uh, you know, it's got this history behind it. And it's what everybody turns out for. Um, but especially lately, like we've been building, like that energy from Pride builds up right into the high holidays, like we're heading into now. Um, so kind of taking that momentum into this season of reflection, season of uh, turning, and um, trying to carry through that feeling of community, even now when most of it is online, um, to kind of hold us together through you know, as it's getting darker and carry us through the winter. Um, and then the winter is for a lot of reasons, um, a softer, you know, like a, a more internal processing, um, where we see it's the, uh, quieter, um, lots of like ritual focus and, um, finding out, especially now when it's, nobody wanted to leave their house in the winter anyway, and, and now we can't. So, um, But And then there's, like, always, always, always opportunities for uh, learning, education, just, like, learning about different things. Um, You know, whether you go to a ritual event or a social event uh, or something purely educational, I try to have that same, like, I bring that same energy and that same passion in myself to those things, and hopefully that carries through. What are some of the programs that you're – either looking forward to continuing that Jace and, you know, their predecessor started uh, or, and uh, new programs that you might sort of have in mind that you're looking to uh, kick off as we, as you settle into the job and maybe we start emerging from isolation <laughs> uh, at some point. If ever. <laughs> Hopefully in the coming six months um, or so. Yeah. Uh, like I said, it's been this really, like right now I'm all focused on the high holidays and that's been a really big, I mean, I'm not alone here. Everybody is doing this, this work of like, how do we have this big, you know, the, the culmination of our year, how are we going to do this um, from such a lonely place? Uh, so I'm working on a lot of that. Um, so that's all going to look new in the past. We've done in person Rosh Hashanah and Tashli, uh, Woodlake and Epidemic Aska. That's, that was really popular in the past. Um, so this year there's going to be some opportunities for, 
learning. There's going to be a study. I'm going to partner with Shirtikva on some study opportunities, learning opportunities. Um, we are going to have a, um, I'm teaming up with Heritage Judaica to get uh, ritual items out to folks who need them for the high holidays. That's going to be September 15th. Um, will be the pickup day for that. Um, and then we're going to do a sort of a distanced Tashli at Wood Lake again, um, and then a, a virtual break the fast um, little social event after Yom Kippur. Well, that's the nice thing about, about Tashli, right, at least right. it's an outdoor activity anyway. So you, you can at least have that and do your best to distance mm-hmm. and wear masks and all right, the things yeah. you need to be doing. Um, yeah, it should be good. And then uh, for the last, this for the third year in a row, we're going to be partnering with Shirtikva again on the Trans Day of Remembrance, um, which is November 20th, um, will be a Friday night Shabbat service. So that's kind of heading into the fall and winter. And then with, every, you know, things are so up in the air so often that I'm, I'm kind of just trying to be on my toes and feeling the temperature of what, you know, what other people are comfortable with, what other places are doing. Um, I'm just trying to find places where uh, I can really just support our community, you know, in whatever they need. So as somebody who's uh, working in the LGBTQ community now, what, I I guess, how do you, how do you do sort of a needs assessment? Do you, is it just the same sort of talking to people? Is it taking your own feelings and experiences into account when trying to um it's some of both of those things yeah uh like i said i have i've been lucky enough to be have been a j pride participant for the last almost five years so i kind of have an understanding of how the program has progressed um both as a participant and now from this um from being in charge of the program um and i spent a lot of time in this last you know, my first month and a half, really just talking to everybody that I can talk to um, from around the cities and being really explicit and asking, like, what, in what ways can I support you? In what ways can J Pride and JFCS as a bigger organization support you? Whether it's, um, do you you need me to hook you up with, uh, like, JFCS's food security program or um, career services, or do you, like I, this, um, break the fast came out of, uh, a participant who said that that's what they were really looking for. That's what they were really going to miss about the high holidays. Um, so it's a, yes, like, what do I think is going to be fun? Um, you know, but then also for people who aren't maybe in the same circles as me, like what going around and asking people, and finding folks who I don't know and saying, like, what do you need? Um, how can I help you? What's going to be fun for you? And that's really important to me. Do you come, did you come to the position as a, you know, with like a programming background or is it more of sort of a social, um, social I, services type of background? For the last 10 years or however long um, I've been working in food service, Uh, so I have a lot of, like most of my background is just in talking to people, meeting all sorts of different kinds of people, um, trying to be helpful, trying to make connections. Um, and then for the last three years I've taught religious school, um, Sunday school, uh, and also Jewish sex ed. Um, so I work, I've worked with a lot of Jewish youth, um, and Jewish queer youth. And that's, um, that sort of carried me through, um, doing programming in my own life. I used to host, uh, Shabbat dinners, Shabbat potluck dinners at Bone Shaker Bookstore on my own. Um, a couple of years ago I had for a little while a queer Torah study group. Um, so this is like all these different pieces of stuff that I was really passionate about and stuff that I was already working on in my own life that, um, when I had this opportunity, I was like, yes, yes, yes. Like I, this is all stuff I love to do anyway. (laughs) That's awesome. So how do you, how how do you, you know, sitting at, um, you know, the intersection of, of sort of queer and Jewish, how do you bring, bring those two together in, in terms of, you know, 
finding, you know, the Judaism, you know, do you find, you know, queerness in your Judaism and vice versa? Um, I mean, yes, it's like, first of all, they both exist in my body, right? So they live near each other in my physical form. Um, you know, I came out for the first time as queer when I was 14, um, 12 years ago. And I came out as Jewish five years ago, almost five years ago when I converted. Um, so those are kind of parallel experiences. Um, and they're parallel experiences in a lot of other ways too. Um, you know, being clocked as queer, being clocked as a Jew, um, you know, from a, you know what I mean? Uh, they're kind of similar feelings and, you know, being a Jew in queer spaces is kind of odd. And then being a queer person in Jewish spaces is kind of odd, um, in similar ways. (laughs) So it's like, it, it, in some ways, this sounds a little sad, but you get used to the feeling of being a little bit other, of being a little bit different, you know what I mean? Um, and, you know, being a Jew and being a queer person, it's always kind of going to be, no matter where I am, there's always going to be like, I'm just a little bit off. And maybe that's what being queer is about, just being a little bit of a freak in a good way. <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> so you mentioned you converted. What led you to convert? I, I, you, and I'm interested in that question because uh, also just the number of sort of like the, the queer Torah study, the Jewish sex ed, like y- you've been doing sort of all of this, you know, is there work tangential to being Jewish that um, you y- feels like you sort of jumped right into it? <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, it's actually not something I talk about that often. And in a lot of ways, being a convert can be a little bit scary because unfortunately some people are not nice about it. Yeah. Um, I was going to say assholes, but I guess I can't say that. I could say that. Um, I could say assholes. (laughs) That's fine. Okay, great. I'll I'll, I'll throw the explicit label on this episode. It's all good. (laughs) Um, And, you know, uh, you can, I've been invalidated before, you know, as a convert, um, even though it's against halacha, you know, yeah. um, it still happens. So in, in some ways it can be a little bit scary, especially in a position of leadership. I sometimes, you know, I, I have these feelings of like, what am I doing here? Is this really like, am I good enough? And I feel like, I mean, everybody has those feelings and I know I'm not alone and it's, uh, you know, I have a lot of really good, really good support from the community and from my family and friends. Um, but as far as just jumping right into it, I guess that's how I do everything. Kind of just headlong, just like, this is what we're doing now. Okay, let's go do it. Awesome. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, like being Jewish is such a communal thing. It was not like I could, I could sit in my room and read a thousand books about being Jewish and not get it in the same way as if I just threw myself into the community and started, you know, sampling all different things and different kinds of being Jewish and hearing other people's experiences and just getting right into it. So other than the, 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 the people who question being a, uh, you know, question your Jewishness being a convert, which is, you know, utterly ridiculous is, you know, <laughs> obviously both mine and TCG <laughs> official position on the matter. It's just, right, right. it's absolute crap. Um, but certainly as somebody who's come, come to it later in life, how, you know, aside from the people, like what was the draw to the religion for you? It, um... I, I that as somebody who's, who's only known, you know, Jewish, you know, by birth. So mm-hmm. I, I tend to, you know, think I have a, I mean, I look at it from a, through a different lens, probably, you know, certainly I would imagine than somebody who is Jewish by choice. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, at first I, I, when I moved to Minneapolis from Madison, um, I moved here with somebody I was seeing at the time who was, uh, uh, who, who is Jewish, um, but who hadn't, 
been practicing since uh, like before college um, or anything. And they came to me one day and they were like, I think I want to get back into like, you know, maybe go to services sometime. And I was like, great. I'm so supportive. Um, and then I started going with him and I just fell in love. I fell in love with the community. I fell in love with the, this way of thinking, this way of seeing the world that's so different and is so like encourages questioning, encourages this wrestling with things that you don't agree with. And, um, it saved my life, honestly, you know, it was, it, it made me like see, like it made me feel awe and like and and feel this like drive to keep learning and keep uh living and having different experiences and you know this is very personal but it did it saved my life you know that's awesome that's amazing i i you know necess- wouldn't have thought um i guess just don't necessarily think about religion having that sort of power but it's yeah. um I mean, and it's amazing for you and, you know, for all of us that it did. Right. And it's, I mean, part of it is like, I don't even necessarily know if I call myself a religious Jew, you know what I mean? That's, it's sure. complicated for everybody. Um, and, but it is like, I, you know, to be quite honest, I, I, when I was a teenager, I was very depressed and, um, was dealing with that for a really long time and this was kind of the first like this was a framework suddenly that was different from my like white lower class um american whatever view that i was seeing the world like this was just enough different to kind of shift me out of some of the my thinking patterns and start seeing the world in a different way you know what i mean yeah for sure for sure. That's really, I think it's excellent. I think it's, I, you know, and it, again, I, my question, I hope it didn't come off as, you know, question being, you know, questioning about, you know, being a convert. I, oh, no, no, no. Oh my God. <laughs> as, no, no. I, and I didn't think you took it that way, but I am really interested in, in the reasons, even if it's just for the spouse, um, it, 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 I, the reasons why somebody chooses um, to convert, uh, or, you know, it, it's just really interesting to me as somebody who, you know, sort of s- has seen it through the same lens for, for my whole life. Mm-hmm. I think it, I think it's interesting to, I, I like having that type of conversation with people as to what sort of brings them in. Yeah. And, you know, like, uh, I'm not seeing this, this person anymore that I was seeing at the time. And when I converted, before I even started the process, I made sure, like I sat down with myself and made sure like I was like, I'm actually doing this for me. I'm not doing this for this person um, that I'm with. Um, Like shout out to Ellie. They're great. Um, But I wanted to do it for me. And I'm really glad that I waited until I made that choice. And um, now I don't like it. You know, it's not like it was something I did for me, like a gift that I gave myself and work that I did for myself. Um, not that there's nothing wrong for like converting for a spouse or for your family or like whatever, like people, there are all sorts of reasons that people convert. And some of them, um, are really, really personal. Um, and some of them aren't. So you mentioned you teach religious school. Where do you, do you still teach? And if so, where are you teaching at? Um, I, uh, taught the last three years, uh, seventh grade religious school at Shirtikva. Um, they are doing this academy for moral imagination this year, which is online. Um, the details of which just came out, but, uh, to be honest, I don't know a lot about it myself and I don't know if I'm going to be returning as a teacher in that program or not yet. Um, and the, the sex ed program that I taught was also there. Um, they hired me in January to do, um, their sex ed curriculum, which they've been doing for like you know, as long as Shirtif has been around for the last 30 years, they've been really on top of it. Um, comprehensive sex ed and thinking from it, from a, of it, from a Jewish perspective, which is really interesting. Um, but that's, you know, that's also up in the air right now. So, and the coffee shop that I worked at is also like, so, you know, I'm kind of just doing this part-time job and, 
um, being a part-time parent and kind of just enjoying this different, like I get to teach, but it's not just teenagers right now, which is kind of cool. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And I was going to ask about the, the Jewish sex ed class. I had never, I didn't realize that was something Shirtika did um, or really anyone else had had been doing. And it's a fascinating, I, I guess, sp- uh, I don't want to say spin, but just a, a a way to you know l- look at something that's so important in a Jewish context. It is, and like that's something like when you're teaching anything to kids, you have to make it. You have to find a way to make it meaningful to them. Um, mm-hmm. So not like not only why do we care about sex ed, but why do we care about Jewish sex ed and what is different about it and. Um, trying to find ways to incorporate Jewish values. And, um, you know, I like to say the Torah is very sexy. There's all sorts of sexy stuff in the Torah. There's all sorts of sexy stuff in the Talmud. You know, there's plenty of material there to translate that. And either whether we agree with it or not, you know, there's some scary stuff like uh, the rape of Dina and, um, you know, take stuff like that and examine it and, and say like, this is what, this is what our tradition has to say about this thing that is very relevant to our lives. Um, not just sex, but anything. Right. So, you know, here's right. and, and I think the idea of some of it being stuff you would agree with and some of it you might, I mean, that's sort of all Torah study or all Talmud study, it is. right? That's why these things are discussed and debated. Mm-hmm. Right. That's like, you know, the kind of the great project of rabbinic Judaism is, is making these shifts, like not losing this tradition. And in fact, being very deeply rooted in the tradition, but looking at things where we're like, oh, maybe we don't like stoning people to death anymore. So we're going to change that and make it not almost impossible. Right. But it's still, it's still our, you know, it's not a different thing. We're not changing it. Um, you know, so Wait, we don't like stoning people to death anymore? It's not a... No, just kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Of course we don't. Stop. Yeah. Uh, right, but it's like rabbis, no. the rabbis made it like, they were like, we're going to make this basically impossible for this to happen, you know? And so right. it is, it really is, and I mentioned this before, like, this is what I, one of the things that I love about being Jewish is just that, like, we're supposed to argue with this stuff. We're supposed to wrestle with right. it. My kids all the time, both my kids at home and my students all the time are like, this sucks. Like, I hate this. You know, this isn't relatable at all. Or like, this is really crappy or really mean or whatever. And I'm like, yes, exactly. Give me more of that. Tell me why you hate the Torah. Come on, give it to me. And I'll tell you know, and then we can pick it apart and, and find out why do we hate these things? Like why? So I like this kind of like, it's, it's a puzzle in a lot of ways. And I really like that. I like solving problems and fixing problems and, you know. And Judaism has all sorts of that kind of, stuff that's they can be picked apart i thought you were gonna say judaism has all sorts of problems which is also true (laughs) so okay so i i know this is this is probably a question that hr wouldn't have allowed to be asked of you in your interview (laughs) process but i but but i should i I feel like i owe it to your boss my friend Mm -hmm. amy weiss to ask it both of your predecessors I know what you're going to say and, and they I... actually did ask me that they, they asked me if I'm <laughs> he's like you're not planning on going they... to rabbinical school are you and I was I was like can you ask me that so yes so that of course is the question both of your predecessors were fantastic mm-hmm. and left to go to yeah. rabbinic school is that something you envision? <laughs> no. Um, I, you know what, I went to college for a year in Portland, Oregon, and I dropped out. I don't mix very well with school, and I don't have the time or the money to go to school. You know, big, big props to, first of all, huge thanks to both Heather and Jace, great people. You know, I could not be there, could not be here without them, um, and I am not the only person who could say that, so, um, they're great, and I can definitely see how being in this position would gear you towards wanting to be a rabbi you know this position in a lot of ways like it's a lot of leading ritual a lot of leading spaces you know um facilitating conversations and um 
requires a lot of vulnerability, requires a lot of writing um, and thinking on different uh, parshas and different issues. And so I could definitely see how that would be a natural segue from here. Um, but I personally am a big fan of lay leadership. So I'm going to kind of stay, stay in that little awesome. corner and, you know, just hang out. I like the Twin Cities. I'm not planning to leave yet. Awesome. All right. Well, that's great. And I, and yeah, I, I I'm a little surprised they asked they you. That, that's all right they too. did ask me. I'm serious, <laughs> dead serious. Oh, that's awesome. All right, Miriam, last mm-hmm. two questions for you. What is your, what is your favorite Jewish food? My favorite Jewish food. Wow. We get, we get into the really um, hard controversial stuff at the end. Oh my God. I know. <laughs> Well, okay, right at this very moment, um, I'd have to say uh, at home, uh, my partner and I and uh, the kids are taking steps to be to be more observant of uh, Shabbos. Um, so we started making cholent um, for people who don't know, which is like a traditional Saturday lunch right you put it you make it you put it in the oven friday night it sits in the oven all day it's got meat it's got barley it's got beans it's uh you can put eggs in it um it's just this very rich very hearty stew that um i'm i've been all about it lately my kids don't really they're like (laughs) Cholent again. <laughs> yes. it's a, it can be a tough sell. I I can sort of understand where the kids come from. <laughs> Not gonna lie. Yeah, so I've been all about that lately, trying out different recipes and different kinds of like black beans versus pinto beans, or barley versus comets or wheat berries or something. You know, so, so you're, you're making it your own. You're, you know, mixing it up a little bit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, what is your favorite Jewish holiday? My favorite Jewish holiday. Oh, I don't want to leave anybody <laughs> out. I have to say Shabbos. Is that cheating? Not Shabbos all. is the best. I, we, we, I do get that answer sometimes. And the first time I got it, it blew me away because I just think of it as, you know, the end of the week. But you're, you're, no, no, see, you're absolutely so right. It is more than that. Um, I was reading uh, some really great poetry by a local, um, by a local queer Jew, Kamara, who was writing about um, Shabbat as uh, uh, like a lover or a girlfriend in in this very like queer um, contemporary framework that I just am in love with. So let's you know the Shabbos bride, right? But let's make it oh, that's queer. Awesome. That's really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Well, excellent. Well, Miriam Graham, thank you so much for joining me this week. It was great to talk to you and get to know you. Uh, Mazel tov on the job at J Pride, and we look forward to seeing what uh, what kind of programming you help lead there. Yeah, thanks. I hope to see everybody um, for the, the various high holidays opportunities and forthwith into the rest of the year and beyond. The Who the Folk Podcast is part of the Jew Folk Podcast Network, a product of Jew Folk Inc. Please subscribe, rate, and review the show wherever you get your podcasts. If you have suggestions for other podcast guests, please email them to me at editor at tcjewfolk.com. For our other shows, check out tcjewfolk.com slash podcast. Podcast.